joining. Um, today I'm going to take a look at a um, deep value perspective on the oil tanker market. Um, now, before I do this, just a quick disclaimer, um, this isn't investment advice. I'm going to talk about some specific stocks here. So this is not a recommendation to trade those securities um, or to even apply my valuation process to those stocks. Um, you really need to develop your own strategy to be a successful investor. Um, and if you can't, you know, please take professional advice. Uh, with that in mind, let's um, jump right in. So why am I taking a look at um, tanker companies? Well, um, anybody who follows um, finance Twitter uh, can't help but notice this is one of the big debates at the moment. And probably nothing has polarised opinion more, um, you know, maybe apart from whether the US stock market is overvalued or not, um, or maybe whether uh, um, Elon Musk is a hero or a villain. Um, but, but let's say it's the third most debated FinTwit topic. Um, and why is this? Well, um, it, it's to do with um, what's been happening recently in this market. So um, with the um, all the, the ongoings in um, the oil market, then tankers have been one of the um, sort of major beneficiaries of that turmoil. The Q4 results um, prior to um, the, the current crisis um, were, were very, very strong results and then um, companies that have reported so far um, have shown Q1 results um, even better for um, earnings and cash flow and we know that Q2 are likely to be even better than that. However, most of the stocks in this market and here I'm showing the graph of, uh, of Euronav I think um, are showing that they're flat year on year. So this either spells great opportunity, either the market's missing something here, or there's been a severe misunderstanding of um, why these stocks are generating um, good results. And this is what I want to look at. Before I do that, let's look at um, a bit about what's happening in the oil market and what has driven such great profitability so far in 2020. Well, the first thing is, excessive oil production. In this graph here, you see that the um, the green line is oil demand, and along with the um, shutdowns to cope with um, COVID-19, oil demand has really dropped off a cliff, falling something, um, you know, uh, m maybe 20 to 30 million barrels. So 20 to 30% of, uh, of daily output has been lost, um, uh, uh, or, or demand, sorry, has been lost due to these lockdowns. However, the oil production has not yet um, fallen significantly. You see in March and April it remained flat, according to this graph from the um, IEA, and um, only really started to fall as the OPEC plus cuts came into effect in May. Um, they're forecast to fall a little bit further into June as more um, producers um, do uh, have cuts, um, but the demand is um, forecast to bounce back a bit, um, but still not in June as far as the current production. So this means um, from March to April to May to June, then you see increasing amounts of oil going into storage. Um, and there's a limit to how much of that um, oil can go into um, onshore storage. So these are the um, the tanks that are at places like Cushing in Oklahoma, where the WTI um, grade is uh, is settled. Um, although they might not be completely full, they often end up being operationally full because they're they're not just there to store oil. They're there to support the um, functions of refineries and producers. Um, so there, there becomes a sort of operational limit to these. And when you reach that operational limit, so that's shown here uh, as an estimate on the, um, the the red line, that means that the excess above that has to go somewhere and it goes into oil tankers. That's either um, specifically for um, storage or that's just because um, the, the the lack of onshore storage means that there'll be a delay for those tankers to offload their products um, to their destinations. And there's a second factor that's uh, affecting this as well and it's something called Contango. Now Contango 
um, is when the futures of the uh, future price of oil is much higher than the current um, near month price of oil. So here you can see some graphs um, from uh, November last year is in green, and then uh, the red is uh, February this year. So this is a uh, this is a fairly um, sort of normal market where the curve is is relatively flat, um, and in some cases, if you know greater uh, greater production is expected to come on stream um, in the future, then the the oil price will trend down. The in, in this in in this instance, um, traders have no incentive to store oil. They have the incentive to sell as much oil now and claim the higher price rather than pay to store that oil. However, with the big drop off in um, oil demand in the near term due to COVID-19, you see that in um, April and now May, this curve has gone um, it, the other way into what's known as contango. So the front month is uh, very low and it rises steeply um, one year out, two years out. Um, so that's what you can see here. The M here is months. So um, and this chart is from um, the ERCE. Um, and you can see that um, that um, that steep curve um, is an incentive for traders to store oil um, and if this curve is steep enough, it even becomes economic to um, use uh, oil tankers to um, store oil for six months or, or one year even. Um, and this takes, um, you know, th th these demands for oil tankers have been driving up um, the rates um, and, and driving up um, the, the price that people are willing to pay to to rent oil tankers and this has caused the um the exceptional profits that we've seen um in the recent months um that are accruing to um those owners of oil tankers but why haven't the the stock prices risen um more you know why is um the uh, market flat despite record quarter earnings um, well, it's because um, the market is expecting um, that bounce back. Um, it's expect um, um, it's expecting the um, production of oil to to drop significantly. You see here um, on this graph um, the um, U.S. rig count and also the U.S. monthly crude production. So you see here that the um, you know those are dropping rapidly. They're dropping very rapidly, which means that um, U.S. oil production is expected to um, to reduce rapidly in the future. On top of that, we've had the um, Saudi um, Arabia agreeing to cut um, oil together with Russia and the rest of um, of OPEC plus, and that's taken out um, you know so far um, 9.7 million barrels of oil. Per day from global production. If you include um, other countries that are not part of OPEC plus, um, then um, like the US, then the, the the drop is even further. And you see a, um, a, a headline here where Saudi is even agreeing to cut more than their um, their original OPEC plus quotes. Now. On the other side, um, we have global oil demand. So um, with the global supply of oil dropping off very rapidly, um, the EIA is still expecting um, a big bounce back in um, oil consumption. You see um, on this uh, sort of longer term chart here, it's expecting in um, in Q3 um, oil production to be um, uh, to be balanced with supply. Um, and um, in uh, sort of as we go from Q3 to Q4, it's expecting um, oil demand to be back and bounce back, um, you know, pretty much to the levels that it was um, before this crisis. Now, um, I, I think this is is potentially a little bit um, optimistic. You see um, below, I've put the graph of the um, the UK strategy for, for opening um, you know, often known as sort of flattening the curve here. So although there has been some restrictions that are, uh, have been lifted recently, things like um, opening restaurants and pubs um, is still planned for um, July at the earliest. And the UK government is also warning people that they're, they're probably unlikely to be going on 
foreign holidays in the summer. So that demand for um, uh, for, for driving, um, you know, with a lot of people working from home still, um, and the demand for um, you know holiday makers to go on planes um, is significantly um, you know or the bounce back in that is is significantly delayed. So so my feeling is that the um, the EIA forecast here is maybe a little bit optimistic. Um, so how does this all feed into um, the tanker market? Um, so I'm going to look at um, both the uh, the bull case and the bear case uh, for the oil tanker market now. So what is the bull case for investing in the oil tanker sector? Well, um, bulls um, who are, are investors in the sector often point out that this is a potentially asymmetric trade. Um, heads I win and tails I don't lose very much. And this is because the um, the 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 sector is um, having record earnings, um, but the valuations, um, you know, or the, the stock prices have not um, risen significantly. Um, hence, um, with them trading not much higher than um, historical valuations, um, this is a situation where um, if things work out positively, you could generate very high returns. Um, but if things uh, don't work out um, as uh, planned, um, then the downside is potentially limited. Um, so also, um, tankers trade a significant discount to their net asset value. Um, and historically, they've traded, um, you know, at their net asset value or, um, or slightly above. Uh, reflecting a um, a business that um, is generating free cash flow from those assets. Um, the strong near-term earnings also de-risk balance sheets and allow dividends or buybacks. Um, so the the near-term um, uh, opportunities to get um, paid for holding your stocks uh, while you wait for any re-rating um, is, is much higher in the current um, environment. Medium term, um, they're expecting um, uh, earnings to be protected by charters. So there's actually um, uh, two usual ways that uh, tankers um, are booked. The first is on spot rates. So that's for specific journeys. Um, and there's also a time charter where a um, a, an oil company, usually a national oil company, will, will rent the tankers for a, a period of time and pay a daily rate um, not just for a specific journey, but for a period of time. Increasingly, um, in the current market, um, the, uh, the the tanker owners are looking to lock up those longer term time charter rates. Um, and that means that any big fall in spot rates um, won't have a, um, you know, as big a negative impact um, as it would um, if you didn't have those time charter rates in place. Um, People who are bulls in the sector often point out, um, as I have, uh, the you know that the EIA bounce back in um, in oil consumption may be a little bit optimistic, and therefore it may lead to um, higher amounts of um, oil stored on water than would otherwise be the case. Um, there's a final sort of short term um, impact here, which is a company called um, Hin Long and um, is a Singapore. Um, trading um, company, uh, they recently entered into bankruptcy and they own um, a subsidiary that has a number of um, very large crude carrier tankers. Um, and some of those are currently taken out of service while the um, while the bankruptcy um, courts decide who those assets uh, belong to. Another part of the potential bull case um, is put by um, the tank company Euronav um, in one of their recent uh, results presentations. Um, and I'm going to go through some of those slides and some of those points as well. Um, one of the things they're pointing to is that there's um, a low order book for future um, VL VLCCs and Suez Max um, um, tankers. Um, in this sector, we can't ignore the capital market cycle. So typically when rates are high and exceptional, this thing means that tanker owners order a lot of extra tankers, um, which means that when those are delivered um, a few years later, rates tend to collapse, which means 
um, the tankers get older tankers get scrapped and this cattle market cycle continues um, and over the cycle the companies don't often earn excess um, excess returns above their cost of capital because of this cycle however looking at this graph we see that the um, the order book for um, future tankers is actually at historic lows so um, and I don't think this is going to improve either because um, with the current um, financial aspects of the COVID-19 um, crisis nobody's really lending a lot of money so the ability to finance new ships and the desire of the certainly the listed tanker companies to invest in um, significant new fleet is um, quite reduced so this is going to provide longer term support for rates also on the the other side that if we do get um, periods of low rates, and it is expected that in, um, you know, kind of maybe into 2021, that rates will go quite low. Um, this is because the oil that's currently on the water and stored on tankers will start to flow back um, onto, um, to be used by refineries and to be consumed. And um, those um, low rates that, uh, you know, that will cause will be caused by increased number of tankers will lead to scrapping of the um the old fleet so you see on this graph here that um tankers have to have um surveys after five years after 10 years after 15 years um but then um after 15 years they have to have the um the surveys um every two and a half years and they get increasingly expensive um as you go along um, the um, they have to have um, ballast water capex um, as well. So um, you're now pointing out that that will cost an additional 1.5 million for the older fleet. So the older a tanker gets, um, the the more a um, an owner will be trying to trade off um, the the value that they can earn from those uh, from that fleet and the scrap value that they'll get for the steel that's um, in that tanker. Um, and that means um, that increasingly those economics don't look good. Um, older tankers are usually um, less efficient on um, oil use, so they tend to be the tankers that get booked uh, least by customers or, or, you know, or certainly demand the lowest rates um, to offset those additional fuel costs. Um, and also um, owners won't be wanting to fit um, things like scrubbers, um, which allow them to burn um, high um, sulfur fuel oil instead of the um, very low sulfur fuel oil. Um, they won't want to fit those to older vessels. Um, so all those things combined mean that um, if we get any period of um, significant low rates, um, you're likely to see um, scrappage of older vessels and that will support the rates of um, newer vessels. Euronav also point out that the um, the recovery from um, you know from recessions where oil um, demand returns historically takes some time. So so here they're um, maybe um, pointing out that the um, uh, as I have the EIA may be a little bit optimistic in how quickly they see oil demand um, recover, particularly if we see. Um, secondary effects from job losses um, so we don't um, um, secular moves like uh, more working from home then we will see um, a slower um, recovery and less oil coming off the water um, than the speed that um, the EIA is currently predicting and the, here, here is the the data from um, 2008 2009 2010 um, and this go, gives the historic precedent for these sort of recoveries from recession. Finally, um, you and I have to point out that um, storage dynamics are not just about contango. So um, here you see in the green the six month contango. So this is um, how much um, money you could make from storing oil for six months. Um, and you see that the uh, you, you, the the spike in um, you know in this year 
um, has led to an increased amount of um, of market storage um, on VLCCs. Um, but in the past, that hasn't been the only factor. So even though the contango rates are now reducing, um, that doesn't mean automatically that oil will immediately come off uh, the water. There's also aspects of storage where people um, use um, oil storage for operational reasons um, and sometimes because there's nowhere else for that oil to go um, in a specific geographic region. So those factors combined give us the uh, the bull case, the reason why um, these exceptional rates um, that we've seen um, in the last few quarters, while they may not stay at um, incredible, um, the incredibly high rates we've seen um, in the past few months, um, they may stay higher than people assume for longer. So we also have a bear case though, um, and this is, uh, often put by some shipping analysts and some of the um, hedge fund managers that follow this sector. Um, and the sort of things that they've pointed out are that Contango has significantly reduced recently. It used to be um, 12 to $15 and is now less than six, which supports much lower rates for storage um, trades on tankers. Um, they also point out that the, um, the bounce back of demand for oil um, will lead to um, more oil um, coming off water and therefore an oversupply of vessels for the regular journeys. Um, and this is the, potentially the concern over 2021, um, is that although they expect the oil um, supply and demand to balance over time, it's pro potentially going to balance at a permanently reduced level. Um, and this means that there'll be less demand for tankers to transport oil um, and therefore the tanker market may be oversupplied. Um, they argue that this combination will lead to rates going to cost or below, um, potentially as soon as H2 um, in 2020 and certainly in 2021. Uh, they also point out that tanker companies have been very poor historical allocators of capital um, and that the uh, potential for uh, for scrapping vessels may not be as large as people expect. With these uh, bull and bear case in mind, um, I'm going to look at some of the companies that uh, are in this sector and I'm going to apply um, some valuation methodologies um, to see whether there is a potential uh, for value in the sector. Now, I haven't done an exhaustive list here. I've picked some of the um, the more popular ones uh, that are followed by people and um, particularly those that are listed on the US stock exchange um, because that um, gives people um, the, the greatest access to being able to invest in these. Um, and the ones I've covered are Euronav, Frontline, TK Tankers, DHT Tankers, Scorpio Tankers, International Seaways, Diamond S Shipping, and Nordic American tankers. So how do you go about valuing these sort of companies? Well, I think the first thing to look at is the rates that they earn. So the um, the daily time charter equivalent rates um, that, that each type of ship owns um, based on the fleet of um, each individual company. So here you can see I've, um, this is the assumptions I'm making. It's a bit of a, um, a busy graph, but you see in most cases um, we have um, a Q1, um, which is, is mostly actuals now. So most companies are reported, um, a few haven't. And here I'm also uh, on this graph showing you the averages um, of my model. So some companies um, will have different amounts of time charter versus spot, and they will have, um, have managed to secure um, different rates depending on how good their um, their chartering is uh, or maybe how lucky their chartering is. Um, so what I'm showing you here is the, uh, the averages. Um, then I'm using uh, the guidance from companies um, on their Q2 where it's available. Um, and you see that almost in all cases, the, uh, the rates that are earned in Q2 um, are much, much higher. Um, and with product tankers, um, because there, there seems to be a glut of um, product as 
refineries haven't been able to um, shut down their production, um, their refinery runs as as much as um, would be required. Um, that's led to a, um, a a bit of a glut of um, products, and therefore product tanker rates have been quite exceptional in some cases in Q2. Um, for Q3, I'm assuming in most cases that we have the uh, current spot. So at the moment, it's the middle of May. So um, spot rates that are are, are booked for voyages um, in the next few weeks um, are likely to extend um, into Q3. They're likely to represent the um, you know the rates of Q3 uh, or the actual rates received in Q3 um, for a number of uh, companies. Um, so therefore. In this case, um, I'm assuming that um, uh, Q3 will be similar to the current spot rates. Finally, for um, Q4, um, I'm taking uh, an estimate of the uh, the one-year time charter rates that companies are booking at the moment. So, so that makes sense. That's the sort of rate that if um, a company was uh, booking up a um, a, a charter for um, one year from from now, um, this is the sort of rates they're charging. So if every company went for time charters, um, then they would be locking in the sort of rates of Q4. Um, and obviously not all companies are going for time charters, um, but it gives you a feel for, uh, for, for where the market sees longer term rates um, over the next year or so. And I think that's a... Um, a, a fairly um, conservative assumption for um, the, the next few quarters. Um, as well as this, we need to consider costs. So I've also made an estimate of EBITDA break, and even, break even for for each company based on historical rates um, that they've published or the accounts that they you know from recent quarters. The other factor we need to consider is utilization. So that's how much of each of the company's fleet is um, being used. So here I assume that um, in, in Q1, which is obviously very strong, um, there may be booking about 85%. Q2 we know is even stronger. So I've gone for um, for 90%. And then a, um, a Q3 down to 85 again, and Q4 sitting around the sort of uh, for long-term averages for tanker companies, which is around the 80% mark. So um, I, I think this is relatively reasonable. Um, you may um, you, you may have other ideas, um, but ju just as a couple of data points, we notice that DHT um, Holdings, um, then they reported a 96% a utilization for their VLCCs in Q1. And they actually beat analyst expectations um, because of that high utilization rate. Um, in light of this, um, you know the uh, or in light of the, um, the 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 current high rates, a lot of companies are delaying their dry docking. Um, so this is where they have to have uh, surveys, or uh, indeed uh, in Scorpio's case, they were going to have um, scrubbers fitted. So this is exhaust gas. Uh, recycling um, uh, engineering, um, which, which enables these these tankers to burn the um, the high sulfur fuel oil compared to the very low sulfur fuel oil, um, and Scorpio reported making five hundred extra product tanker um, charter days available in twenty twenty by that um, by that deferring of um, scrubber installs. Um, if you do some quick maths, if we assume that, um, you know, uh, based on current rates, they they may be um, delivering about $50,000 a day um, above cost, then these 500 extra product tanker days would deliver 25 million extra free cash flow to the company. Um, plus, obviously, the, the costs of the scrubber install are deferred. And without, you know, most of the cases, there's no penalty for this deferring. So in the short term, these um, th this high utilization and these um, delaying of uh, of dry docking um, is leading to more exceptional cash flows for these sort of companies. So with these in mind, and um, I, I'm modeling the, um, the 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 fleet of um, 
each company, you know, the, the number of um, different tankers of different grades that they uh, they own. Um, I come up with some um, some valuation metrics for 2020. So first, let's look at um, what I think the forward price earnings ratio is going to be. Um, note that, um, you know, along with some other assumptions here, I've also normalized uh, depreciation in this case. Um, we'll look into that a little bit later. But the, um, the, the, the reality is I've looked at, um, based on forward market curves, what's the likely drop in value of um, the tanker fleet um, of each company, um, rather than taking their, um, their, their income statement um, depreciation um, that's reported. Um, it, it probably doesn't make a, a big difference in this case, um, but it's worth noting um, the methodology I've, um, I've followed. So this doesn't mean um, th these may not be precisely what's uh, reported in earnings. Um, this is not really um, an earnings forecast, but just to give a feel for um, what sort of level um, the forward price earnings are. And as you can see, they're very, very low um, compared to a US market that, you know, is um, on a 12 month trailing P of about 20. Um, you know, some of them be being between uh, one and four um, are exceptional low price earnings. However, um, there's a there's a couple of issues. This the first one is um, these are exceptional times, so it's not really fair to um, value a company using um, price earnings on a year where it's um, you know the most exceptional earnings uh, potential. Um, and equally, it doesn't take into account that a lot of these companies are highly geared and have a lot of debt on their balance sheet. So. Uh, what you um what you'd usually look at um in this case um is the um ev to ebitda so in this case this takes into account obviously the enterprise value takes into the not just the current market capitalization um and the the, the data i'm using here is from uh, from google um a market close on the uh, the 15th of may um for the uh, market cap data um, and obviously the enterprise value adds in the net debt um, to that. Um, and usually when you use enterprise value to, you know, we would compare EBITDA rather than earnings. So here you see that, again, these, these, are, these are relatively um, low values. The, um, I think the 2021 forecast for um, the US market is a, a, an EV to EBITDA of, um, uh, of over 12. So with most of these coming in between three and four, um, these again look um, look good value. But we have to remember this is an outstanding year. This isn't um, a, you know a, a normal year in the tanker market. So um, uh, and you see as well the um, some of the lowest values here, TA tankers, um, you know, um, it's uh, it's the product, it's the product tankers that are giving um, the um, high rates, um, uh, the uh, and the high earnings, um, the high EBITDA, um, and Scorpio Tankers has the same, but it's also probably the most indebted company, so therefore it's not appearing as um, as good on an EV to EBITDA level. Um, and and what does um, you know what does a typical value investor do when um, future earnings are uncertain and you can't make a, um, a, a an estimate of value on on earnings alone? Well, um, we tend to look at net asset value. Um, so as well as estimating earnings and EBITDA, um, I've also had a go at estimating uh, what the um, what the likely uh, net asset value will be for these sort of companies at the end of 2020. Um, the first thing to do is I wanted to look at what were the ship valuations. Um, so, um, and not just the ship valuations today um, or what was reported on the balance sheet because of course, um, you know, different depreciation policies um, can cause significantly different um, valuations, uh, valuation of tankers or, or assets on the balance sheet. Um, so to compare like with like, 
I downloaded all of the fleet data for all of the ships um, for each company, um, their age and the type of ship they are and how much um, is owned by that particular company because some of them have, for example, joint ventures. Um, and I also produced some valuation curves using data from um, companies such as Cleves, Compass Marine and Poton. Um, then I managed to create, um, you know, by taking the average of those, those different, um, those different ad lists, um, I managed to create curves, which allows me to um, predict the, the, you know, the value of each of the ships in each of the fleets um, at, a sig at a particular point in time. Um, and this allows me to um, give a, um, a, a valuation for the entire fleet of each company. Here you go, here's, um, here's the outcome of that. Um, and you can see that this graph is, um, again, the enterprise value um, divided by the esti estimated market value of that fleet. Um, uh, and here you see that the, um, the, the values vary. You see uh, Nordic American, for example, seems to be um, um, trading at a, quite a premium to the value of its fleet. I don't think it's a, um, a coincidence that they've been one of the more promotional companies um, in the sector. And so investors have, have bid up um, the value of that company um, above the value of its um, or current market value of its fleet, according to my estimates. At the other end, you have um, Diamond S Shipping, um, who have been uh, more cautious on earnings and earnings outlook. Um, however, they seem to trade at the biggest discount to um, the current value of their ships. Um, you see that, you know, uh, on average, apart from a couple of exceptions, most of the sh most of these companies are trading at a discount to what they would get today if they sold off all of their ships and returned um, the cash to investors. Um, worth noting here that, um, uh, you know, kind of TK tankers is a bit of an outlier. I think um, uh, I think about a third of their fleet uh, or quarter of their fleet on um uh, the the website is um, is bare bones charter so is down as zero percent ownership um, so I've accounted for those as um, you know at, at a zero value um, however then probably is some joint ventures and some other um, uh, some other um, uh, ways of valuing those fleets so they may have access to assets where um, they're not the owner but they do get the um, the economic benefit from those. Um, so on that metric, um, you know, on this metric shown here, that may unduly, um, uh, 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 unduly be, be unduly pessimistic for that particular company. Um, if you're interested in that company, um, it probably bears worth um, looking into those details um, in more detail. Um, so I had a good think about, well, um, what what would I want, you know, what is a conservative way of valuing these companies given that they um, have a certain number of assets um, and they have very good um, near-term earnings potential, um, but the long-term earnings potential is quite uncertain. Um, and I came up with the idea that um, I'd want to be estimating the, uh, the net asset value of the company um, at the end of 2020. So after this, um, exceptional earnings cycles ended. What would be the nest, the, you know, an estimate of net asset value for these companies? So I took um, my estimate of fleet value at the end of the year. Um, I added in um, the forecast EBITDA that I'm um, forecasting for FY20 um, from the last balance sheet date. So I think some of these companies have reported Q1 and some of them haven't. So um, I, I looked at the last balance sheet date and I added the, uh, my estimate of EBITDA from that balance sheet date. Um, I took off the net debt um, because obviously that's a, um, uh, uh, th th that doesn't accrue to shareholders. Um, I added back in networking capital, so different companies maybe hold higher amounts of, uh, of networking capital than others. And then I finally took off the uh, what I was forecasting they would pay in interest since the last balance sheet date. 
So this is hopefully a, um, a, a an estimate of um, the true underlying value of the company at the end of 2020. And this is what I get. So um, this is the outcome of my model. Again, the data is from Google and based on the market close on the 15th of May. Um, and we see that a number of uh, companies um, there um, that yeah, you know, my forecast is is actually at a, um, a a significant premium to the current market capitalization. So this is suggesting that um, uh, that there may be um, some significant undervaluation in a number of these companies. The exception again being Nordic American Tankers, uh, which looks to be um, to be at least fully priced on this sort of metric. Um, what does that give in terms of, uh, of potential upsides? So, um, so so here you go, here's the upsides in uh, percentage terms. So let me remind you again, I'm not making um, making these as uh, price targets or saying that the um, these companies will, um, will trade at this level, um, but it does go to show um, the potential upsides if the market decided to um, to close, you know, to, to recognize my valuations here um, of each of these companies. Um, Diamond S Shipping is the um, the highest here, and that reflects the fact that it's um, currently um, trading at the biggest discount to um, the, the current value of its fleet. Um, as already said, Northern American is the smallest, um, and but we see that you know maybe taking average of sector, um, there's there's potentially a good fifty percent upside for for the sector um, based on this conservative um, valuation methodology. But there are a number of limits to this asset view. So the first one is um, there's uh, there's in some cases quite a big gap between my estimate of the market value of those ships um, using um, the, the the valuation curves and the list the fleet list that's published um, and the, um, the the value of that fleet that's on the balance sheet of um, the company so although I'm not directly looking at the the fleet value here I'm looking at the the, the book value so that includes um, uh, all, all of the working capital um, uh, and other factors, um, in this case, um, estimated book value, tangible book value versus balance sheet equity, where I've taken off any intangibles um, from that equity. Um, here you see that, um, you know, some differences in the companies as well. It, it appears that um, uh, probably Euronav and, and Frontline um, are maybe... Um, and maybe more conservative on their depreciation policies. So they may have depreciated their ships on the balance sheet um, more than the market value of those ships. However, um, uh, Scorpio tankers, International Seaways, um, Diamond S and Nordic American, maybe their, um, their depreciation policies may be um, a little bit more aggressive. Um, I'm not saying they're necessarily um, wrong. You know, my, my, my valuation is my valuation um, based on um, the, the data that I have. Um, but maybe that they, um, um, they have a more aggressive valuation pol um, depreciation policy um, or there's other factors that I haven't considered. Um, an example here is um, Diamond S Shipping, uh, you know, has, has about 1.8 billion um, of uh, balance sheet value for its ships. Um, whereas my estimate is about 1.5 billion on the current market value. Again, um, it, it, there could be many reasons for this, um, but 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 that's the differences I'm seeing. Um, we also see that those um, the fact that I think it's 17 out of 54 TK tankers assets are listed as as bare bones charters without with zero ownership um, also shows that um, shows up on this graph with the um, the 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 balance sheet values or the, or the balance sheet equity being um, being higher than the, um, uh, the my estimate of their book value. Um, and 
even though those um, you know th those factors give um, some significant upsides um, based on my conservative valuation, there's no guarantee that the market will recognize these. There's no guarantee that um, this discount to net asset value or predicted net asset value, net asset value um, will actually close. Um, you know, for these upsides to be realized, it requires that discount to, to, to NAV to be closed. You know, it might be through buybacks, um, you know, market perception. For example, um, Scorpio tanks is highly leveraged. Um, you know, so you might see that um, as that, um, that company deleverages um, with the exceptional cash flows, that discount to net asset value may close. But there's no guarantee. We might not see any of these net asset values close anytime soon, which would make these uh, th these estimates of upside or, or estimates of um, uh, of gaps to um, predicted net asset value uh, merely academic. Finally, um, the, the the other limitation is um, I'm making assumptions about ship valuations here. Um, so it could be that, um, you know, ship valuations are unduly um, high and in the future ship valuations will uh, will drop off significantly and by the end of 2020 we'll see uh, very low ship valuations and this will blow a hole in my um, uh, my assumptions of net asset value for these companies um, however when we look at this um, uh, th th this this graph here of um, kind of ship valuations from Compass Marine, uh, then you see that um, if anything, ship valuations are fairly low at the moment. Um, there doesn't seem to be um, the big uptake that we saw. Um, you see back here in um, 2015 was the last time um, there was um, exceptional returns for shipping and we had Contango in the oil market. And you see that the ship valuations reacted by um, increasing significantly. But we haven't seen that here. So there doesn't seem to be significantly significant excesses in the current ship valuations. That doesn't mean they don't um, they can't fall um, or go lower. Um, but it does give us some confidence that this isn't um, an unusual bubble in ship valuations. Um, finally, uh, my model so far hasn't taken into account um, which ships have scrubbers fitted. Um, or other equipment like that. So it doesn't take into account that um, any variations of valuation for those um, for those particular vessels. Um, I, I may do some more work on this in the future, but just be aware that um, I, I've taken an average value of uh, the average ship um, of that age and that type, uh, and I haven't done a specific valuation um, based on other knowledge, such as um, being whether a scrubber is fitted or not. One final fact to consider um, before we move on is that um, different companies will have different risk profiles and these are usually defined by how indebted a company is compared to their assets. Now here I um, again using my model of estimated ship value um, this time the, the the estimate of today's value or, or at least the last balance sheet value um, gives you um, a, a feeling for how indebted each company is compared to that value. Note this will be different to the, the balance sheet gearing because um, the, 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 the balance sheet um, of each company will again have different depreciation policies and things like that, um, you know, giving different um, valuations of fleets. Um, whereas in order to compare, I'm using my estimate of ship value today. Um, again, um, potentially ownership um, issues with TK tankers might um, unduly punish um, it, it on this measure. So um, again, look into more details on that um, if you're interested in that company. Um, but what stands out immediately here is that um, Scorpio tankers is the most indebted. Um, I, I think that's probably fairly common market knowledge. Um, and that Euronav is probably the most conservatively um, geared out of these um, stocks. Um, so, and I don't think it's a surprise that Euronav are returning, um, I think it's something like 80% of their um, their earnings as dividends each quarter, um, whereas uh, Scorpio Tankers has um, a, a very small dividend as it focuses on debt repayment with those cash. Um, all things being equal, 
um, then you would expect um, both to to add shareholder value, um, but obviously it depends on the um, capital, the, the quality of the management and the, the capital allocation skills of those, um, those particular management of those particular companies. So on top of my, uh, my estimate of, uh, of, of a net asset value at the end of 2020, you would expect that despite the, um, the potentially low rates of 2021 that are forecast, um, that then the, the, the ongoing business may have some value above the value of just the, um, the ship net asset value. Um, so there are some potential opportunities here. There are the, you know, um, the opportunity for companies to fix time charters and to keep these exceptional rates running um, at least part way into 2021. I noticed that Euronav um, actually did a uh, a two year VLCC ch um, time charter at uh, at almost forty nine thousand dollars a day recently, um, and DHT actually has um, uh, you know booked up six of its uh, very VLCCs um, for um, for a year at a rate of uh, of sixty seven um, k. So there clearly is. Um, depending on the company, um, opportunities to book um, longer term time charter rates and keep the um, the, the company earning um, money above the, the above their break even level um, into 2021. Um, if we do see low rates in 2021, um, then the the low order book and the high fleet age um, potentially going to cause that that scrappage. Uh, and no new tankers to be built, and we could see um, higher rates for longer post 2022. Um, and also, um, it's it's been notable that uh, a number of uh, stocks have had increasing short interest um, across the board, um, and therefore, as those, um, uh, it, although at the moment the shorts seem to be um, to be making um, uh, making profits in the near term. Um, then that might provide a uh, a tailwind for these companies um, as those uh, as those shorts close um, their positions. So, in conclusion, um, this sector does appear to demonstrate some value, even for the conservative investor at the moment. Um, if that value accrues to shareholders, then it's going to require the uh, the, the net asset values and, and things like that to actually close. So it's it's is no guarantee um, that uh, that that value is realised, um, but there does seem to be some value out there. Um, however, when you balance all of the certainly the the, the um, six or seven companies that I've looked at, there doesn't seem to be one clear winner. Um, you have more conservative companies. Um, that, uh, that that maybe have um, lower earnings, but you also have um, companies that are highly indebted but have very significant earnings potential in the short term. So probably the best thing to do if you're interested in the sector would be to hold a basket of stocks rather than just one or two. Um, even so, the precise outcome at the moment is, um, it is highly uncertain um, and you can guarantee, you know, the one thing you can guarantee that 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 it will be ups, it will be volatile. You will see both upside movements and downside movements in this sector. Um, however, there doesn't seem to be much reason why the, um, you know, why these companies have sold off on, um, you know, on earnings concerns. The the short term results have been very good, um, and there are reasons to think that. Um, you know, there, there's undervaluation um, and that despite the, the poor outlook, you know, a number of these companies will still do quite well. Um, and then, you know, as the uh, as the cycle extends, um, then into 2022, um, I think we may see um, see higher rates and we may see, um, a, you know, kind of ongoing profits accrue to these companies. Um, probably the most interesting thing for me that I find about this sector is that um, uh, the, the short term cash flows that it, that it throws off, um, many of which are returned as uh, as dividends to uh, to investors or, or as buybacks, 
um, are negatively correlated with short-term GDP growth. Um, if uh, GDP growth comes back much more slowly than expected, then we will consume less oil. And that oil must be stored somewhere and it will increase the um, storage of oil on water and increase the rates that tanker companies earn on spot markets and increase the, um, the, the cash flows that they generate in the short term and the cash flows that they return to investors. So this should act as a little bit of a hedge against our owning other equities, so other undervalued equities. So as a value investor, I can see that there are, there are some attractions to this sector um, because of its uncorrelated nature, as well as its potential for some, some amounts of cash flow to be returned to investors in the short term. But we also need to be uh, cautious, I think. So um, it, it's the, this is often known as the tanker trade. And I think um, th this is probably one of the problems. Um, as a trade, this seems to be a bit of a, a busted flush because we've seen that uh, companies have delivered record results and the market sold off. Why exactly? Um, I mean, it might be because the exceptional results were anticipated. It might be that this is a crowded trade. Um, it might be just that, um, you know, the longer term rates and the drop off of, of Contango um, has led to um, systematic investors um, to, to sell the stocks. You know, we really don't know what the uh, what the precise cause is. It may be some part of all three. Um, but this means that those who are going to use leverage for this trade are probably going to lose as are those who try and use options and more advanced um, ways because um, the using options uh, applies time constraints. You know, you don't just have to be right, but you have to be right in a specific time frame before those options expire. Um, and um, even if, um, you know, the, you, you take on uh, long-term options, um, then the, the, the time value of those options will decay um, as you go forward and as the the trade doesn't um, that doesn't go the way you anticipate um, in the near term. So trading this, you know, uh, viewing this as a trade, I don't think is a very good way to play this. Um, you know, value investing is about buying unloved securities that are trading at a significant discount to a conservative estimate of the underlying value and holding as long as it takes for that gap between price and valuation to close. So people who are interested in this sector should view it as an investment, should view it as um, a an investment in a sector that's going to pay um, exceptional cash flows in the short term. And despite some, um, some concerns over the medium term, should also deliver returns in the long term. Um, so that um, th that viewpoint is how, in my opinion, um, investors should treat this. They should get out of the mindset that this is a trade and build a mindset that this is a long-term investment in something that appears to be undervalued on a conservative estimate. Um, if you do that um, and the um, potential positive aspects occur, so um, some of the um, the upside things, then you will be very pleased. Um, however, you you should you shouldn't bank the farm. You shouldn't be playing um, options or using leverage to try and enhance your returns. Um, you should be treating this like a normal investment, a normal value investment that you would do. Um, Value investing, of course, requires um, a unique personality. You should you have to be able to go willing to go against the um, against the market. So when all of the market is selling off and saying, um, you know, this is um, th this this is a terrible sector, and um, everybody who is short or um, is a bear on the sector is um, is crowing and saying that they've they've called it right. Um, you need to have the um, the strength uh, of personality to go against the market, um, as it is with all um, deep value investments, and uh, buy when the market's selling, and sell when the the market is buying and is overly excited by the by the stocks. 
And that does require a unique personality. Um, so that brings me to the end of uh, this look at tankers and tanker stocks. I hope you find it interesting, informative. Um, maybe it's an area you've not considered before um, and haven't looked at. Um, if you want to learn a bit more about psychology and the personality traits um, that I've just mentioned at the end, um, you know, what what personality traits a, a value investor, for example, may need to be successful, um, then please pick up a copy of my book. Um, it takes you through some of those, uh, some of those through some of those aspects of investment psychology, um, and also helps you to build um, a better investment portfolio. Um, it's invest. It's available on Amazon, um, so just search uh, for excellent investing on Amazon. Also, please check out my other video presentations on some of the more controversial topics investing. Um, subscribe to my channel and uh, check out my book recommendations on my website, uh, follow me on Twitter, um, or if you've got any uh, comments or feedback, um, please also feel free to email me. Thanks for joining, and I wish you successful investing.